It's great when you've got a microphone and a stage. You feel so important, honestly. It's amazing. It's really dangerous to give somebody like me a microphone and a stage. Um, so, yes, my name is Simon. Uh, my work at the moment, for the, since 2010, has been distributed under this name because I don't like using my name. It's embarrassing to have your name uh, on programs and things. So I've always used other, other comp like company names instead of my own. And the part of my career that I'm going to talk about today is the Circa 69 bit. I've got to figure this thing out. All right. Okay, so I'm working across a lot of uh, different platforms, but basically underneath all of that, um, right from the beginning of my career, I've been essentially a storyteller. But telling stories now in 2019 is very different to even at the beginning of my career, which is probably about like 27 years ago, something like that. So you can see that I'm using a lot of technology, but more importantly, and what I'm going to talk about today is this game system design, speculative design, and transmedia storytelling. And just, it's important to establish what transmedia storytelling is, I guess. Um, whereas maybe back in the day you would make a novel or a TV show or a film. Now, of course, um, at the very least you would make a film and a website and some social networking and so on. But really, transmedia storytelling is about using lots of different mediums in one continuous story. So rather than making a website about your story, about your book, or about your film, the website is a part of the story. And everything that you're including in your mix of medias is part of the story. So as you heard, um, particularly since I've been taking this approach, transmedia approach, I've been touring a lot more, meeting a lot more people, uh, and getting in places like Tate Modern. And this is kind of Having bigger audiences has also kind of woken me up to some interesting things we can do when we start including uh, games design and games technologies. And what I'm going to talk about today are two things. One is, how does an artist work? So coming from the perspective of an artist is different to being, say, a creative at an advertising agency or working in a game studio. It's not that that I'm doing. Um, I'll explain more. But secondly, how does an artist collaborate? So one of the things that I'm doing is I'm doing consultations with people like organizations like the Ambulance Service in Australia, with uh, lots of universities, um, working with software developers, um, working with people with disabilities, with um, immersive technologies, lots of a broad spectrum of things. And this might seem like a silly question until the next bit that I'm going to tell you. So in order to talk about what an artist is, because uh, there's a lot of confusion about what an artist is, I I'm going to sort of break it down by telling you about the place where I live. Because this place, Brighton, uh, it's about 250,000 people, and about 249,999 of them are artists. It's a city which is completely full of artists. And it really changes the city. There are some very strange things that happen in this city. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about that as a way of so you can become acquainted with what artists are really like. Um, it's interesting to note that the logo for the city is based on a building in the city which nearly bankrupted the UK. Um, it was built by a crown prince who liked to party all the time, and he built this house, uh, this, this palace to have parties in, and it sort of sets the tone for the city. It's a party city. It has the biggest pride celebration in, in the UK, um, and it's a place people come to to, to party. I'm going to show you a series of head, headlines from uh, our local newspaper. Um, so it is apparently now the most godless city in Britain. Um, and this is not just like a hatred of, of religion. It's because it's full of artists. And artists have this thing that they like to kind of unpick everything. They like to, um, they like to interrogate everything. Even the nice bits of religion and the things that come with religion have to be interrogated. So Father Christmas every year gets arrested and interrogated, asked about his links to Coca-Cola and the commercialization of Christmas. Um, we get attacked for this all the time as artists. We're always being attacked for kind of taking things that seem to be concrete in society, definitions of reality, and we have to tinker with it and ask difficult questions. So we're always under attack, and that becomes part of the job, that you have to be able to defend yourself. Hopefully, there'll be some questions later that will give me the opportunity to do that. Um, we're kind of idealists, so 
you know, like maybe there should be an emergency service if your shoes are uncomfortable. But that's the kind of thing of an artist might do, you know, like call the fire brigade to take her shoes off. Um, because we're unconventional by nature, it's important that an artist is unconventional in the way they think. We sometimes attack back. Okay, we don't just take the attack. Sometimes we come at you, all right? So, um, like witches, artists are never going to come to your office and work with you in your office, okay? We have to be kind of unshackled and free to roam, okay? So we have something in common with witches. There's quite a few witches in Brighton as well. In terms of the way we express ourselves, it's not always in a conventional way. If, for those of you from here, does, it, does anybody know who UKIP is? Yeah, good. Gosh, you get our news. Um, yeah, so when, when they come to Brighton, they have uh, toilet rolls thrown at them. And it's a metaphor, obviously. You know, we, ju we don't just debate with them. We throw things at them as well. Um, and if you happen to be a politician in our city, it's a very difficult job keeping all of this in control. Because an artist, by definition, as far as I see it, needs to be unemployable. An artist needs to be somebody who has no boss. That's really, really important. So if you have a boss, you're not an artist. If, you, if you're one of those people that's going through doing creative stuff and you have no boss and you can say whatever you want, then you might be in the territory of being a candidate to be an artist. And the reason is because the role of the artist is to ask difficult questions. Um, and to do it unshackled to any kind of commercial or ideological standpoint. So when we are brought in to uh, look at whatever subject matter we're making a piece of work about, it's about really interrogating it, critically analyzing it, trying to find holes and weaknesses in it, and constantly um, picking at our definitions of what the world is. So I'm going to talk about, with that as a sort of background, I'm going to talk about the way we work, and I'm going to talk about that in terms of a project that I've been doing. But first of all, I'm going to say that during my career, the audiences have changed from looking like this, very passive and just sitting still, to being more like this, um, where they become the center of attention. So at the beginning of my career, actually, it was electronic music, and I would be on a stage like this, and everybody's looking at me. It's awful. It's horrible. And sitting there. And now I'm really not present anymore. It's the audience who are the main attraction. Uh, that's been a big change in my career. And a lot of this is happening uh, whilst other, those kind of passive mediums are all in decline. So this is uh, figures from the Arts Council in Eng England. Uh, Arts Council England measured that theatre audiences are falling at about 10% a year, 5% a year. Um, meanwhile, immersive theatre is one area of that that's in growth. Uh, because immersive theatre, if you've, if you've tried that, uh, you become the centre of attention, it gives you the, the scope to become creative within the infrastructure of the piece. It's a slightly different thing to sitting and just listening. This is a quote from, I do consultation for a theatre in Belgium, they did some research into their audiences and had the horrific realization that their audience would all be dead within 20 years uh, because young people aren't going to their venue anymore and the people who do are a very narrow demographic. They're getting older and they're going to disappear. The same goes for cinema. So this is the figures for the US and Canada. Uh, as a percentage of population, audiences are falling. And that takes in the whole of cinema. So imagine now if you're in the indie kind of cinema area, you can see that the, economically it's under a lot of pressure uh, and very, much more difficult to finance and so on. Traditional TV, so sit that, TV where you just sit back and you flick between channels and take what you're given, um, that's basic. These are old figures, so the, this is basically dead, as you well know, um, because you're all watching Netflix instead. But during, at this point, in 2015, there was an interesting statistic that came along with that, uh, that fall in, in demand for TV, and that was that 87% of people were watching with an, addi an additional device in their hand. And that's because they had the compulsion to make it interactive. They wanted to be a part of what was going on. So if you look at shows like Making of a Murderer, Murder Mountain, um, The Keepers, I think it was called, all of these shows have this curious facet to them, and that is there are holes in the story which are designed for you to search on Wikipedia or on websites or look up interviews whilst you're watching so that you become part of the unfolding of the story. Meanwhile, uh, through this whole period, gamers 
uh, and gaming in general has been growing and growing and growing and growing, um, and is much bigger than music and film combined uh, by 2019. But there's this measure in economics. Uh, I also studied economics, by the way. Interesting. Um, that's, there's, a, there's a measure called, um, uh, and I forgot it now. Was it marginal satisfaction? What's that called? Marginal utility. Marginal t utility for every dollar you spend, how much satisfaction do you report back? Uh, gamers are double everybody else. They're spending more money, and they're reporting back much higher levels of satisfaction with the culture that they're consuming. All of which, all of those figures amount to me saying, essentially, we're now in an era of playful media. That's the dominant media. It's the most important cultural area on the planet. Um, and it's an area where the audience becomes an important part of how the culture unfolds. All of this, uh, in terms of working as an artist, I realized around 2012, 2013, that the rules were changing. So previously, when I'd been making cinema, um, there were these rules that said, when the audience comes in, they're aware, I'm aware, that whilst the lights are up, the story hasn't started yet. We're in reality, the fiction hasn't started. And when the lights go down, we are fading down reality and fading up the fiction. And the same goes for kind of even the architecture of it. We know that where the seats are, where you guys are now, that's reality. Where I am over here, that's fiction. We had these nice little divisions between reality and fiction. As soon as we started moving into playful media, and particularly in terms of transmedia storytelling and using websites and social networks, giving all your characters a Facebook page and so on, we started to confuse the two. And not many people were doing this. There are some interesting landmark projects around 2004, 2005, 2006 that really played with this. But it's something that I've been playing with a lot more. How do we play around with the audience and trick them uh, as a way of provoking debate around interesting subjects? 2014, the film industry was worth 36 billion. The games industry was worth 83 billion. Uh, it's, much, uh, it's a much bigger difference now, but the reason I'm mentioning 2014 was because that was the year that this arrived, which was the Oculus DK1. It was horrible. It made you feel sick. But then shortly after that, the DK2 came out, and shortly after that came out the HTC Vive, and suddenly virtual reality was something spectacular. And you have to think about virtual reality. Instead of thinking of, of it as virtual reality, think of it as a replacement for a screen and a mouse and a keyboard. And then you understand, especially when you're working with people with disabilities, that it's an accessible way to access media in a very immersive way. So I'm going to tell you, in terms of that question, how do artists work, I'm going to tell you about a piece of work that I made, which has been all over the world. And I'm going to say right at the beginning that virtual reality, although the headset came out in 2014, uh, and there have been previous headsets and so on, Forget the technology, virtual reality itself is not new at all. It's very, very old. Um, so with that in your mind, I'm going to tell you about this show. This is a show called Whilst the Rest Was Sleeping. Um, and rather than explain it to you, I'm going to show you a quick trailer for it. We lose ourselves all the time, waking momentarily every now and then to realize that great expanses of time have been lost. This is the story of something very strange that happened in 1959 in America. Maybe the monsters are those things that attempt to bind us to one idea, he said. I want to know more about the story, but I want to tell other people the story. One of the strangest things I've ever done. It was proper and massive. And also, I suppose, because I know it's, it is a true story. And maybe the angels are whatever amounts to zero. What happened was so strange, in fact, that none of the people directly affected by the story have been able to tell it for over 50 years. Whilst the rest were sleeping beneath the circle of black sky, 
I killed him. So this story, um, it takes over a whole venue, okay? And it's comprised of lots of little bits of show, okay? So actually this show can tour with just certain elements to smaller venues and it can take over a whole big venue. So it was in Mexico City, it took over a, a great big venue which was um, um, for Mutec um, Electronic Music Festival. Uh, there's 17 virtual reality installations. There's people install an app on their phone so they can do an augmented tr reality trail. There's an hour-long um, film which I play electronic music over live. Um, there's a version where there's a string quartet and people on stage reading out extracts from letters. Um, and there's more, which I'm going to tell you about in a minute. A lot of the virtual reality that I'm doing, right from when I first started in 20, 2010, I was looking at psychological research into multi-sensory immersion, so using the physical sensations, uh, fans when you go outside so you can feel the wind, sensations on your hand, um, vibrations and various other things, uh, smells uh, are in, in, involved. So it's not just the eyes and ears as in just the headset. That I'm, I wanted to sort of make it much more um, immersive than that. And the story that it tells is a really weird story that I first heard about when I was 13 years old. My grandfather used to come over once a week to have dinner, and he always brought me a gift of some sort. And on one day, he brought me this magazine called Mysteries of the World. And it had this story about how in 1959 in Idaho, in a very small town called Albion, uh, eight college kids who were all about 18 years old went on a school trip with their science teacher on, in the school bus. And... By the end of the day, they hadn't returned, and they never returned, and they were never found, and they completely disappeared, and, which is a strange story in itself, but it gets stranger because after two weeks uh, of looking in the community, checking, you know, you see those images when people disappear and they were walking hand in hand across land looking for any scraps of clothing, uh, they found nothing, but the police discovered uh, two and a half hours drive north, about 10 miles into the Great Basin Desert, the school bus, and it had been set on fire. It was completely destroyed. And about 10 miles from there, they found a black wooden shack. And inside that shack was a table. And on the table were eight letters, each one written by one of the young people. And these letters were goodbye letters to their parents and their loved ones. And they're very, very strange letters. Um, these letters were in a, a museum called the Burley Historical Society, which is about 15 miles away from where they lived. And my producer managed to persuade them to work with us to be able to tell the story. And as soon as we started looking into the documentation of this story, the story became much, much weirder, and we tried to tell all of it with this show. The interesting thing, just like Making of a Murderer and Murder Mountain, those Netflix shows, was that 63% um, of our audience went online during or after the show to try and find out more information. But that wasn't an accident. We designed it that way. You'll see that in that, uh, in that trailer, there were mainly young people and we deliberately uh, chosen uh, gamers as test audiences because we knew they were the biggest audience. Um, and we were interested to see what they would do. And sure enough, they went online and they went looking for all the Wikipedia pages and memorial sites and the museum website and so on and so forth. Some of them were even emailing the museum to try and find out more information and so on and so forth. Because we now live in a time where people carry computers in their pocket and you know that the first thing they're going to do when they don't know the answer to something is go and find that answer using mainly Google. So the show, we never told them that there was this stuff online because we, didn't, we knew we didn't have to. All we had to do was put little holes in the story, little bits of unknown, and we knew they would go and search for the answer. So we only ever told them about the very small part of the show, which was the, the, the 17 VR headsets, the live performance, et cetera, et cetera. We never told them about this bit. We didn't need to. And there's an element of game system design where exploration, the ability to surprise yourself and find things you didn't know was there makes you feel happy, okay? And once they got online, they found out there's much more to the story because there were relatives who survived. And one of those relatives was a writer who in the 1960s wrote a series of novels and um, uh, books about, which all references disappearance. Even in 1968, he made a record, which he pressed 25 copies of, and I managed to buy one on eBay for 400 pounds and make it part of the show. And so it got much more interesting. There are much more interesting 
facets to the story in terms of how people dealt with this problem. When people were searching online, what they eventually found was a website which revealed that 10 years after these young people went missing, every year the relatives would go to the spot where their, the letters were found to memorialize them, and on the 10th anniversary, they found another letter, and it was a ninth letter, and it was written by the teacher, who, because there was never a letter from the teacher in the original um, discovery. And this letter talked about something called the Mohawk Valley Formula, which it turns out was a public relations formula developed in 1937 um, by a company that had previously um, been employed to bully people who were on strike. So it was called the Pearl Berghoff Company. Up until 1937, what they would do is if a company, the workers were on strike, they would go into town, they would employ people who'd come out of prison, and they would beat them up with baseball bats, and then the strike would end like that. Uh, but in, by 1937, this approach was no longer popular. It was proving to be uh, a PR disaster. And so they decided instead to try a different type of violence, which was to create a virtual version of reality, which was different to the real one. So what they did in 1937, the Pearl Berghoff Company, was that they, any time that the strikers were shown, they were called agitators. Um, there was always violence in any uh, photograph of them. There was always soldiers and fire and barbed wire. And every time the bosses of the company were shown, they would be standing next to their nice wife with their nice children with their little lunchbox, and they seemed like the good guys. And there was a clear caricature uh, of the two groups, and the strike was broken very quickly. This approach was then used to invade Guatemala without having to fire any bullets and various other things that we know about. Um, so virtual reality was invented probably, let's say, with the Creole Committee in the First World War that convinced the American people to go to war. Um, so the audience find this letter which is telling them about the Mohawk Valley formula, and the idea is that then they realize that I've just used the Mohawk Valley for formula to tell them a whole load of lies about something that didn't happen, and I've convinced them that it did. It's interesting to note that a lot of audience members don't want to believe it isn't real when they get to this point. They still want to believe the disappearance was real. They're emailing the museum, and they're speaking to the museum director. It's actually me in my hotel. Um, sometimes I pretend he's out and I'm his wife. Um, they're emailing different characters that emerge in the story. It's all me still in my hotel, emailing them back. They go to social networking sites and find characters, and they, they try and get in contact with them, and it's all me again, um, pretending to be a variety of different people. So you can see the acting where I was acting in the 1990s. I'm still acting, but now it's just behind a keyboard because I got lazy. Um, so within all of these things, these mediums, although what get, grabs headlines is virtual reality, augmented reality, artificial intelligence. Everybody loves that now. If I mention that, everybody wants me to come and give a talk. But actually, what underpins all of this, what makes it important, is the game system design, speculative design, and the use of transmedia storytelling to create these huge universes. What games do is they facilitate a kind of all of the things that make us happy, flow states, heroic purpose, creativity. They give us a sense of having value in a virtual world. 65% of the world's population are now gamers. Quite a lot of those play so much that it's basically a job. Because their real jobs aren't give, giving them those kind of qualities. And if you look at the very, very, very basic things that games do is they set a goal for you, they set some limitations in the form of some rules so that you have to be creative in, in trying to you know, achieve your goal. And if you're including speculative design, then you're asking a question. So rather than me as an artist telling you what I think about propaganda and what I think about marketing and public relations and how it affects the way we see the world, I'm going to throw it out to you to answer that question, okay, and have debate. This was the question, in a way, that whilst the rest of sleeping was posing, how do we define reality in a world dominated by paid-for, persuasive propagandist messages? And it was very interesting what the audiences had to say. Like I said, a lot of people didn't want to believe it wasn't real. That was a real revelation to me, especially in the wake of Brexit and, and Trump and all those things. This was an academic from uh, Cambridge University who completely thought the whole thing was real, went on a big journey, and she started a debate on her Facebook page, which we discovered. So people are now having a conversation. I'm no longer there, which is the correct thing. I should be out of the picture. I design the system, and then I walk away, and I let people 
have a discussion around it. We do things like this. Every show now has some sort of lecture and Q&A thing, so we can start discussing it. And so it kind of starts to fall into this realm of games for good, which is where we take all those things that games deliver that make us happy, but we make them have an impact in the real world. So taking all of that, that's quite a naughty thing to do, tell people a bunch of lies uh, in order to start a debate. So how does somebody like me um, collaborate when it comes to working with big companies? And bear in mind, my role isn't to uh, play by the rules. My role is to come in and question things and maybe be a pain in the neck. Outside of the collaborative work, it's very interesting to note that in the UK in particular, because of the way that the country is set up for limited companies, you can have a single director limited company, which means that most of the artists that I work with, rather than having one company with seven people, now I have my company, which is me, and my collaborators have their own companies, and we come together when we need to. So Jibet is in Nairobi in Kenya, Andre and Damir in Sarajevo in Bosnia, and Maya is in London. And around one of the projects I'm working on now, that's the team. 90% of the work is me, because technology for making games has improved so much that you can pretty much make a whole ton of, like those 17 VR installations were all made by me, apart from little bits of code, little bits of animation by Andre and Damir. And when Myra has a project, we all kind of clump together in a different formation to form a different, it's not a company, but a collaboration like that. These things mean that we, uh, we're not wasting any time with the whole reinforcing hierarchy thing. When I was uh, doing my degree, I had to do a year in industry, and I noted that the people at the top of the chain were just spending most of their energy reinforcing the fact that they were the boss. So we would have meetings with advertising agencies who come up with three solutions to a problem, and they would just bark them off and send them on their way just to tell them, I'm the boss. It just seemed like such a waste of effort and so old-fashioned and such dinosaur behavior to me. It means that we're really quick. When we're making work, uh, that's, that show um, took something like three months to make all those VR installations and so on and so forth, because we can work real quick. And it... It invites this experimental approach, which means we can go into territory which is A, interesting for audiences, but B, is very difficult to copy. Something we noticed very early on around 2010. When we were doing things in an interesting new kind of way, it was difficult for people to unpick how we'd done it and copy it. So one of the big collaborations I've done over the last 12 months is with the ambulance service in Australia. The ambulance service in Australia runs on a contract basis. The people who get the contracts are charities. It's an interesting uh, model. Um, so St. John's Ambulance in Australia runs the ambulance service for Western Australia, a very big region like that. And what they wanted to do was to create some new training tools which are more efficient, which didn't need so much travel, bear in mind how big Australia is. And so they wanted to look at virtual reality as a way of training, uh, first of all, for first aid and then later for medics. And you have this big organization. It's a very big organization with a very strong hierarchy. And then you have me. I'm, I'm the artist over here, look. Found that icon. Proud of that. Um, how do I fit into something like this? There's no way that I'm going to go into a meeting room and, and pretend that he's my boss, because it, it's just not going to happen. So the very first part of the collaboration was, let's discuss how we're going to make this work. It just so happened that the guy who was the director uh, that I was in contact with knew who, who I was. He knows my father. And so he knew that it was going to be trouble. Um, and, but he just really wanted some virtual reality, and he knew that I was the guy. So we had to discuss, how are we going to make this work? And we decided we would have, and he loved this. When I mentioned Black Ops team, he got so excited. <laughs> so we created a Black Ops team, which I helped them to recruit. That team was small. It was in the same kind of model as the, the kind of collaborations that I do. Very small. One uh, model or animator, one coder, one product manager. I helped them to recruit these people. Um, and it was them that I dealt with. So I never had to deal with these guys. I went for five days to Australia and hung out with them. I, I turned up late for every meeting. It wasn't on purpose. It was by accident. I was, hung, you know, I was hungover, tired. <laughs> There's a whole list of reasons. But that was, I think they understood then that it was a waste of time trying to deal with me directly. So then once a week, I dealt with these people in this little team. And they were so small and so agile, we were able to do really cool things. 
there were other people trying to develop these tools at the same time. Um, two of them were in the UK, and I went to see them, and they were big organizations, and they were just struggling with these big teams trying to make something that's, you know, virtual reality is new. We don't even know how to tell stories in this, in this medium yet. And they were struggling with it, and we were getting right to the point real quick because the team was so small. So we got all of those, those benefits that come with small teams. And I mentioned Games for Good uh, and the ability to bring all these heroic kind of uh, creative practices into the real world. Well, this app does something really cool. You can go and get trained in first aid. Then you install an app on your phone, and it makes you part of the ambulance service because when an accident happens in the street outside, if I've got the app and it's going to take five minutes for the ambulance to come, they call me first, I run out, I'm the hero saving someone's life, the ambulance people come over, we have a little transition between my app and, and your forms to fill out so that I become part of the ambulance service. So I'm a hero now. Brilliant. That's, that's so 2019, right? We don't want to just be receiving things anymore. We want to be part of it. This happened. When we first tested it, someone came in, she completely ignored the app and did Tai Chi for half an hour. Because virtual reality is new, we don't know quite how it works. We have to do user testing. So again, it reinforces that hierarchies are useless in this, in this area. We can't, we can't have a director telling us how we should design it, because he doesn't know. I don't know. I'm the one who's made 17 VR installations. I don't know how it works. We have to put people into it, and we have to user test it. And it's the data that comes out of that user testing, which just tells us how this is going to go. Hierarchies for me are like a thing. They're just such dinosaur things. They just get in the way of, uh, of actual creativity. What I guess we have in common, the big companies that I work with and me, is that we both want to get the attention of the audience and do something spectacular and amazing with it. And it's, it appears to me, when you think about the fact that there's this narrative in the world that attention spans are falling, OK? Particularly in my country, it's like tabloid newspapers moaning about the fact that young people can't concentrate for longer than two seconds. And you look at Instagram, and on Instagram, the optimum duration for maximum interaction is 26 seconds. You go, what's wrong with people? Why can't they concentrate for more than 26 seconds? And it, and it seems that way, right? Until you look at Steam and you look at the player statistics, and you find out that the top 100 most played games, there isn't a single game that isn't played for more than 50 hours on average. And the most played game, the average player plays for 430 hours. Now think about that. Let's say we were going to make a campaign about the Syrian refugee crisis. We could make a 26-second Instagram video, but all we could really do was try and persuade people to change their mind. That's all we can do with 26 seconds. But if we're making a game and we know they're going to be in there for 430 hours, we can recreate the model of the problem and let the player try and figure out a solution and include people. That, to me, is the future. Persuasion is a thing of the past. It's, it's really it's for the old men who run these big advertising companies that are all about to collapse because they're struggling. Advertising doesn't work quite so well anymore. This meaningful involvement of people, not only does it automate kind of democracy in a way that governments have never been able to do, it makes us happy. Games make us happy. They make us creative, they give us purpose, they make us part of something much bigger than just ourselves, all of the things that make us happy. That's how you find me, by the way, and that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting talk, Simon. Um, do we have any questions from the audience before we go? Um, Serena, after this. Lady here, just wait for the mic one second. And we're streaming, you're, you're, so apparently we, yeah, we need uh, the microphone. Two seconds. Cheers. Um, just especially with the last thing, I, I'm a big fan of transmedia storytelling as well as uh, multimodal expressions and so on. It's my jam. So I'm really excited. But have you considered that the 27 seconds isn't the entirety of the Instagram experience? People are playing Instagram, and we're not really tracking how much time people spend on social media apps, but they are very much part of the gameplay and the storytelling that people do about themselves. Um, so what, 
I have, I mean, there's very much to be said for Steam-based games and things like that, narrative design here, but um, have you considered the impact, especially with the clicktivism and the idea of playing social media as a way of storytelling for change? If I'm honest, like we started touching on that with whilst, whilst the rest of sleeping, and I don't really understand it. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's it's not my, I'm not native to that world. I although I've been there with social networking from the beginning, still I see it as like I have a 24 year old daughter. I see it. I, I see the way she uses it, and it's very different to me. Um, and that, really, for me, I guess it was it was surprising the way people were using it. In, in, in whilst the rest of sleeping. I didn't make a big thing of the social networking until I started touring with it and realized that it, was, it had to be a much more fundamental part of it. So I kind of feel like I'm still exploring that and what it means, but also the, the landscape is shifting right within social, social networking. So, um, so I don't know what the answer to that is. I, I want to know, I want to find out. Okay. Oh, Uh, hi, I'm Arne. Uh, it was a really inspiring talk. Um, I have one question to the 430 hours playing that game about the Syrian refugee camp. You would then need another 430 hours to go, go out into the world and then do what you found out in that game and change things. Do you think that maybe uh, after playing that game you are so satisfied uh, with yourself that maybe you don't change anything? I think that that's maybe if you're expecting the player to go and do something, you know, if I played a game that was about, I mean, I have played games that are about certain problems in the world, and what am I going to do about it? But if you're the, at the moment, I'm talking with charities, and they are interested in a couple of things. One is raising money, and the other one is norm shifting, so changing people's perspectives. And changing people's perspectives with video is, uh, is not doing so well. But for good reason, because we understand we don't trust being persuaded. We've had years of people trying to persuade us to buy things, vote for things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we are, in, we are intimately aware that mostly what they're telling us is lies, and we find it out too late. Um, there's a great mistrust for persuasion, I would say, in, 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 in the world. I think that um, if you take the Syrian refugee crisis, most people you ask, if you ask them about the problem, they wouldn't understand it. Most people, like in my country, there aren't many Syrian refugees. My daughter, her boyfriend is a Syrian refugee. She can't even come back to the UK with him because he can't come into the country, even for a week. So how are we supposed to know what it's actually about or what the experience is like for those people? So if we're going to make some media to try and educate people, well, we could make a documentary, but really the people watching it are going to be the people who um, already know something or already partly persuaded or whatever. I think that it's um, the playability aspect. Uh, I don't have the answers to how we make that work, but I'm interested in how we explore. And this is, what, uh, this is why I'm talking to charities at the moment, about the idea of gamifying or making altruism and norm shifting a playable uh, thing rather than a persuasive thing. Okay, thank you. Another question? Um, thank you for the fascinating talk, first of all. Um, my question is, um, one of the big things on social media is challenges. People love doing challenges and they get really viral. So have you, have you tried incorporating some kind of challenges in, into one of the kind of games you've, you've done so far? So I think there's an interesting thing there because if you look at, um, say, older, older games and the traditional kind of games, which are challenges, which are much more puzzle-based, somebody like me, and when I get faced with a puzzle in a game, I switch it off and go away. I don't want to do puzzles. I'm not five years old. I don't want to have to find a key to go through a door. Thank you very much. I know how to open a door. Um, what I'm kind of interested in, and I think it's an, it's an interesting area of games where there's a new audience emerging, is where the problem isn't how do I get through the door or how do I shoot something or all of the kind of stuff you know, that, that people regularly associate with games, but where it's, say, for example, if you look at the narrative games like Firewatch or Everybody's Gone to the Rapture or Dear Esther, Actually, the, the, the goal is to try and figure out what the hell's going on a lot of the time. And that's interesting um, because you have agency within that game to go and explore it and try and come. I mean, if you think about how subversive Firewatch is a game, who's played Firewatch as a game? Quite a lot of people. Um, 
Firewatch does something really interesting. It makes you fall in love with two people when you're only really in society supposed to fall in, one, in love with one, right? There's a, there's a moment where the second person asks you after we leave here, should we meet up sometime? And you, you, you want to go, yes, I, I know I'm not supposed to, but yes, I'm going to say yes like that. It's very subversive. It's very interesting. By giving agency to audiences, we are implicating in them in the choices of the character. So I don't think we necessarily need to have the traditional kind of puzzles or traditional goals where you rearrange a series of blocks and everything is, is cool. I think the, the puzzle can be much more about the story itself. Mm. Uh, what I had in mind was actually more of a, like a physical challenge, like you go out into the world and do something. I had a personal example. There's a challenge now that you go out and you pick trash for 10 days. And then you realize that you know there's actually a lot of more trash than you know you don't you didn't realize you're walking yeah. down the street that you can get a whole bag full of trash from one single street, but you actually you can. Gotcha. So if you incorporate this kind of challenges into a larger story world, it could get more interesting because you know you get tired of doing it after ten days, but you know maybe if there's a st larger story world, you can do. It. So this is classic gaming for good, and actually, so the project that I'm working on at the moment, which fits that kind of. Bill, hopefully this is an answer. Um, I'm doing a piece of work um, called A Unique and Spectacular Moment, which begins as a video game. Uh, you're playing the video game in a venue like this, let's say. Um, you buy a ticket, you start playing the video game, and you find yourself in the role of one of two people who live together, and you both work. And you're in your morning routine, and it's boring and dull and mundane. You don't really want to go to work, but you have to because you've got to earn the money to pay for the rent for the place you're living in. You're, you're in the apartment. And on this particular day, you and this other character decide that we're going to call in sick, we're going to pretend we're strangers, and we're going to go out into the world and do something spectacular and amazing. We're going to have a moment. We're going to do something really creative and amazing and escape this boring routine of getting up, going to work, and coming home again. And what happens at that point in the game is that a radio walkie-talkie goes off under the table. And when the player takes it out, what they haven't realized is the other character is also real. And they're in another part of, uh, of, of a kind of particular geographical zone. And they have to find each other, pretend they're strangers, which they probably are strangers. And then they have to go and do something unique and spectacular together. And the idea of this game is that if you take a, a particular geographical zone and you say there is a ratio of positive and negative actions happening in this zone, if you could measure that, what we want to do is create a, 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 a up the ratio of positive things happening. Because there's a lot of uh, effects from that kind of thing that we, we know about from psychology. If, if suddenly you raise the amount of people that are smiling in an area, um, it lifts the whole area. And that's the idea. We want to take that game and that kind of experience to take a, a specific geographical zone and it's speculative design again because we want to find out what happens. What happens if suddenly within a park, it, this is going to launch in Australia, in um, Brisbane in, in the autumn, and it's in a park, the venue's in a park. We want to know what happens to the park when suddenly every five minutes there's people doing unusual things strange things as a spectacle. What does that do to the area? Um, so I, I guess that's the closest thing that I'm doing that's kind of in, in that territory. Thank you, that's all we have time for. And this is for you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Simon. <laughs>